Great. Thank you for all everyone for joining us on another uh, part of the series with uh, aging. Uh, I'm Ch Brian Chen, Chief Science Officer at Foxo Technologies. I'll be your moderator for the day. Uh, today, I have a special guest that needs no introduction, Dr. Steve Horvath. I'll ask him to give a brief bio about himself in a, in a minute. But the goal of today is to have him, in his own words, walk us through um, essentially the history of the development of epigenetic clocks uh, and the journal aging has played an important role in that. Um, so Dr. Horvath, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so um, my name is Steve Horvath. I work on molecular biomarkers of aging, particular interest in methylation-based um, biomarkers of aging. I've been a professor at UCLA in human genetics and biostatistics. Um, more recently, I've um, started a new employment at Altos Labs in San Diego. And um, I'm here to talk about uh, many articles related to epigenetic clocks. Um, epigenetic clocks are multivariate predictors of age or mortality risk. Um, based on cytosine methylation. Um, cy um, cytosines are one of the letters um, uh, in the DNA, ACTG, and um, a lot of my work has focused on cytosine methylation, um, which um, um, accrues with age at certain locations, and conversely, there's also loss of methylation with age at other locations. And by um, keeping track of both of these aging patterns, one can develop very accurate estimators of age and mortality risk in many mammalian species. Perfect, and that's exactly what an epigenetic clock does, right? These are algorithms that take epigenetic data and then can calculate age, biological age, et cetera. Great, and that's the topic of today's conversation. So uh, with that, we'll jump in. The articles, um, will appear in chronological order. For many articles, I give meta comments, such as um, what my opinion is of this article, you know, and uh, follow-up studies and so on. So I'll start with the very first article that I published um, in Aging, which is um, a, entitled, The Cerebellum Ages Slowly According to the Epigenetic Clock. It's really the main finding um, of this study, but this um, I could have given it a different title. I could have uh, entitled it as studies of supercentenarians. And um, so in this article, um, we analyzed um, um, many different organs from people. And here I show you first, um, results from middle-aged people as opposed to centenarians. And um, the, the bars show different tissues, post-mortem tissues. The y-axis shows um, the pan tissue clock. This um, clock applies to all human tissues. And um, what you see is overall, um, there isn't uh, much of a variation. Most tissues have roughly the same age in middle-aged people. And um, however, the question is, what happens um, when we look at centenarians? Maybe we find pronounced differences uh, across organs. And um, this study um, was uh, done here. So there was, a 112 year old lady um, and she donated um, um, her body to science 
And um, we analyzed 30 different organs. And um, this is in panel A. And you notice that in her, the cerebellum showed negative age acceleration. Age acceleration is the discrepancy between methylation age and chronologic age. And what we observe is the cerebellum and several other brain regions are much younger than all the other organs. And uh, the other panels show um, these re similar results in brain samples from other uh, super centenarians. So here's this person was 114 years old. Again, the cerebellum is much younger than all the other brain regions. So um, this is already our main finding. The cerebellum is really the uh, part of the body that ages the least in humans. And fast forward, fast forwarding to now uh, 2022, I can tell you that this results holds for many mammalian species, but not all, you know. So we looked at mice and rats and so on. And I was hoping that this finding would hold for all mammals, but um, that's not true, you know, just for certain mammalian species. And um, yeah, the, the article then um, looks at a potential explanation. Why is it that the human cerebellum is much younger? And so we did a transcriptomic analysis, um, which has a lot of limitations, but we compared this gene expression data in the cerebellum to other brain regions. And um, here, biological processes that come up, mRNA processing, RNA binding, helicase activity. And um, at the time when I wrote the article, I was very intrigued by this aspect of helicase activity because it reminded me of Werner syndrome. And But if I had to write the article again, I would actually probably look at I would focus on this mRNA processing transcription, you know, um, because in our recent um, studies in many mammalian species, we keep finding the, the great importance of mRNA processing. Um, mRNA processing is splicing, you know, so, um, um, so maybe the insight is that the cerebellum it, it does something quite different when it comes to mRNA processing compared to the other brain regions and compared to um, other organs. Um, I should tell you, when I developed the pan tissue clock back in 2013, um, there was one part of the body that gave me a lot of trouble, and it was the cerebellum. I mean, I must have spun, spent months on that problem, what to do with the cerebellum. And this article really um, um, explained to me personally why I had such problems. And the reason was because the cerebellum ages more slowly, you know. And whereas I thought um, that, oh, maybe I had bad training data, you know, I thought it's a data quality issue. But um, moving to the next article, this article um, has been largely ignored, but it was a huge effort <laughs> to create the data for it. So um, this was a, collaborator with Rich, uh, a collaboration with Richard Walker. And Richard um, um, really studied children that didn't seem to age. So um, I... Um, and the title says it all, you know, epigenetic age analysis of children who seem to evade aging. And um, these children have a severe developmental disorder where they remain eternal toddlers. So here's one um, uh, girl at different ages. This is at age 15. So this girl never learned to speak and she, she didn't seem to develop and didn't seem to age. And that's why Richard Walker was so interested in, in these um, children. And also these children had received a lot of media attention because the hope was that there's some mutation that could arrest aging in, in children and, um, and teach us a lot about how to slow aging in older adults as well. 
anyway, so um, we analyzed many such children, many is a strong word, but many relative how hard it is to collect, you know, and to find these children. But um, when I analyzed the blood of these children, um, I didn't see a difference. So um, maybe you can see here in panel C, this is now syndrome X. So these children with this curious disorder um, are called syndrome X children. And the age acceleration is around zero because my epigenetic clocks work perfectly well in these children. They tracked aging. So at least at, um, at the molecular level uh, for methylation, um, these children very much developed and aged, you know? So um, anyway, that was that study. But you do see this blue bar and there was, we had one child who had Down syndrome. And um, now this is statistically not significant because sample size of one, but you see this one child um, had severe age acceleration. And I can tell you this finding is true. So very recently I studied um, um, blood samples from newborns. Um, and uh, with Down syndrome and controls. And again, newborns uh, Down syndrome cases have also epigenetic age acceleration. And this is also observable when we look at mouse models of Down syndrome, you know? And um, so um, my opinion is that um, Down syndrome is the ultimate progeria when it comes to epigenetic clocks. Very robust effect, not just in blood, but also in brain tissue. Um, moving on. This is a paper regarding cancer. Um, this analysis was carried out by uh, my former postdoc, post Morgan Levine, who was very interested in lung cancer. And she found that blood methylation data in the Women's Health Initiative are predictive of future onset of lung cancer. And um, this study um, was a little bit underpowered, um, but um, what I can tell you is that um, in later studies, um, people carried out large meta-analysis of epigenetic age acceleration in blood versus incident uh, cancer. And if you have large sample sizes, you do find an association. So yes, uh, these epigenetic clocks are predictive of future cancer. But um, the question is, is that um, um, clinically relevant? And my opinion is uh, no, um, because the effect sizes are simply too weak, you know? So um, now I need to emphasize this pertains of course to blood methylation based on uh, PBMCs, you know? Um, so that's my statement. So uh, these methylation data are not informative uh, for the clinical use. However, um, as you know, there's a totally different school of thought where one looks at extracellular DNA shed by tumors um, and there are companies that uh, commercialize these um, tests for early detection of cancer. So, um, so that works beautifully, apparently, you know. Um, but long story short, as I said, overall epigenetic clocks do predict uh, um, future onset of cancer um, in large cohort studies. Um, this is now a completely different paper for, um, this was a collaboration with Claudio Franceschi and his Italian collaborators. And we were very interested whether centenarians age more slowly according to epigenetic clocks. That's a question. Um, however, to do that study properly, you need to use a trick, which is you cannot look at centenarians per se, rather, you need to look at the offspring of centenarians because then you can find age-matched controls, right? <laughs> so, um, and this is, this study um, involved this Italian cohort and um, the scatter plot shows you um, 
the methylation age on the y-axis versus chronologic age. Um, the dark dots are the offspring of regular folks, people who died in early on. The orange dots are the epigenetic ages of the offspring of centenarians. And sure enough, we found, as you can see in these bar plots, that the offspring of centenarians were epigenetically younger according to several different epigenetic clocks. Um, and I really like this finding. It makes obviously biological sense. However, I would have loved it if somebody had validated it, you know. And I'm really not familiar with any study who even attempted to validate it, you know. So this was a study of Italian centenarians, but this should be repeated in offspring of maybe Japanese centenarians or any other population. So I just don't know whether it validates in other cohorts. Moving to another article, a collaboration with uh, Beata Ritz, who uh, is very interested in Parkinson's disease. And um, we looked at blood samples and saliva samples from Parkinson's disease patients. And the title of the paper summarizes the two main findings, increased epigenetic age and granulocyte counts in blood of Parkinson's disease patients. And um, let me make some comments um, about um, my main interest was, of course, increased epigenetic age. That's why I studied these individuals. However, our software also allows us to estimate blood cell composition based on methylation data. There's a software called Hausman uh, method um, that imputes, for example, granulocytes, which are mainly neutrophils. And um, so this finding that neutrophils are um, much more abundant in blood of Parkinson's disease was an accidental finding, you know. It, um, and um, I can tell you this finding validates in every study of Parkinson's disease globally, different populations. Interestingly, PD patients have higher, uh, higher abundance of neutrophils. And, but what about the first finding, increased epigenetic age? That finding, I would say, is weak, and we have a hard time validating it. And so maybe um, I can show you here this analysis. One really needs to um, look at ancestry. So Caucasians or European ancestry, um, we found really a weak effect. If you carefully look at these bar plots and p-value, p-value 0.06, right? It's suggestive p-value. In European ancestry samples, the effect was very weak. However, in Hispanic individuals, there we did see, at least for this Hannum-based measure or, or, um, or um, EEAA measure, there we did find a stronger effect. And um, I've been um, a member of a couple of follow-up studies uh, of much larger uh, cohort studies of PD. And we did not validate um, the finding of epigenetic age acceleration and PD in individuals of European ancestry. So take this with a grain of salt. Um, however, as I said, um, the other main finding was, of course, um, the, the aspect of um, neutrophils and that that is utterly robust that finding and it does it is not related to medication use like levodopa or so on so to me the, um, to me people should really look at whether neutrophils could perhaps predict uh, future onset of pd um, moving to another paper um, by my former postdoc morgan levine um, she looked at um, Alzheimer's disease and um, amyloid load and various um, readouts of um, Alzheimer's disease in the religious order study. And um, long story short is that, yes, uh, people with Alzheimer's disease exhibit um, epigenetic age acceleration, 
However, these effects are weak, okay? So um, um, stronger effects could be observed when we correlated, um, for example, neuritic plaque status or diffuse plaques or um, neurofibrillary tangles to epigenetic age acceleration. So uh, we did report uh, significant findings and these findings validate. But um, for the experts among you, when you look at these correlations, they are often weak, less than 0.1. So the pan tissue clock really has only a weak association with these neuropathology measures. And um, more recently, people have published what I would call custom clocks for cerebral cortex. And they do show much stronger associations. So several groups are working on these cortex clocks. I want to briefly mention Jonathan Mills group has published a cortex clock. And um, these clocks, again, show much stronger associations. But I, um, but I would say overall epigenetic clocks do relate to um, AD and related um, um, neuropathology measures. Now, moving to another paper, Huntington's disease. This is a collaboration um, with Huntington's disease researchers, William Yang and many others. And um, we studied human brain samples from Huntington's disease individuals. And the main finding is that yes, epigenetic aging is accelerated in these brain samples, but not all brain regions. So it was important to remove um, the effect of the cerebellum. Remember how the cerebellum is different, you know. But um, here you, you do see kind of um, um, the bar plot in panel D. We compared 205 brain tissue samples from HD individuals to 228 control samples, and the p-value is 0.02. What's the message? These are weak effects. You need very large sample sizes. And you know, um, more recently, we have looked at mouse models of Huntington's disease, and we looked at brain samples. And it's the same story, you know, the, actually the effects in mouse brains are also quite weak. And, um, and they were paradoxical findings because th there's a grade of Huntington's disease. And individuals with a high grade, meaning their brain shows severe um, um, loss of um, these medium spiny neurons, the, suddenly the epigenetic age even appeared younger, you know. So um, overall weak effects in Huntington disease. Um, but I do want to draw your attention to another publication where we looked at blood samples and interestingly, in human blood samples, we did find that people who have manifest HD, they also exhibit epigenetic age acceleration in blood already. Hmm. Moving to um, uh, one of the most important articles, this is from Brian Chen. Um, he looked at a meta-analysis of uh, predicting time to death. And to give you a bit of uh, background, um, when I developed the first epigenetic clocks, it wasn't clear at all whether these clocks are biologically interesting, why they were defined to predict chronologic age. And there was no um, um, evidence that they would be biologically interesting. And um, here, Brian showed in the largest uh, cohort study over 13,000 individuals, um, three uh, ethnic groups, European ancestry, Hispanic ancestry, African ancestry, that yes, um, these epigenetic clocks uh, predict uh, mortality risk in humans. This was um, this work extended a previous study from Ricardo Marioni, who had also done a, um, a similar study, but um, Brian's work extended these results to other ethnic groups and just much larger sample size. So here you see um, the table of cohorts, 13,000 people, uh, which was really a, 
a large logistical effort to get all this data. And um, this is um, the key figure that showed hazard ratios um, um, for mort mortality risk due to all cause mortality. And um, I think the p values 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 9. And the panel C shows 10 to the minus 43. So this is a new measure. Um, EEAA stands for extrinsic epigenetic age acceleration. This measure is um, um, based on the so called Hanum epigenetic clock that uh, was developed for blood, but it extended the Hanum clock in an important way. It added uh, uh, measures of blood cell composition, for example, naive CD8 T cells, and therefore amplifying the signal. And the resulting mortality predictor was uh, better than the original Hanum clock. Um, now, the experts will look at the hazard ratios and they will be disappointed because uh, here the hazard rate ratio is 1.04. But mind you, this is the hazard associated with one year of age acceleration. Um, if you have 10 years of age acceleration, the hazard would be 1.04 raised to the power of 10. So suddenly you have a substantial uh, hazard ratio. And um, now this, this analysis pertains to so-called first generation epigenetic clocks that uh, measure chronologic age. But in later papers, we developed so-called second generation clocks that are tailor-made for predicting mortality risk. And I will get to that. Before moving on, I want to say that uh, Brian did a very comprehensive analysis. He also adjusted for many clinical uh, risk factors, for example, smoking history, um, obesity, prior history of diabetes, and so on. And the exciting result was that even after adjusting for all of these um, um, potential confounders, the results remained significant. And that uh, supports the claim that epigenetic clocks enhance traditional risk factors of mortality. So they add something. And here are the risk factors. Uh, you see alcohol, smoking, history of cancer, hypertension, physical activity, which is protective, obviously, and so on and so on. So very comprehensive analysis. Um, now we're moving to another article by a Spanish team. And they were very interested in osteoarthritis. And um, they looked at three different tissues, blood, bone, and also cartilage. And they used my um, pan tissue clock. And interestingly, osteoarthritis was associated with increased epigenetic age in cartilage only, but not in the other tissues. And this is a nice example of what we have found with many age-related conditions which is that um, often they have cell type specific effects. You see uh, age acceleration in one cell type, but not all. Um, moving on, this is a, a study from my former student, Austin Quack, which answered the following question. Does healthy lifestyle affect epigenetic clocks? And uh, so what is healthy lifestyle? Um, obviously diet, uh, vegetable intake, physical exercise, educational levels is protective and so on. And um, in this study, um, uh, um, Austin found um, that um, epigenetic age acceleration according to the extrinsic cl clock, the Hanum based clock, is associated with lifestyle factors, but not my pan tissue clock. And um, the results make sense to me. Um, and before I go there, I want to just show you some of these uh, p-values. So um, in, in this study of the Women's Health Initiative, we had access to 
um, a blood measure of vegetable intakes, mean carotenoid levels, and you see that a p-value 10 to the minus 9, so this extrinsic epigenetic age acceleration measure very much tracks uh, vegetable intake. And then you see also conversely risk factors, uh, insulin, glucose, anything related to metabolic syndrome, obesity, all of that uh, um, has an effect, uh, educational level, p-value 10 to the minus 10. So, um, but we do see these findings mainly for epigenetic age acceleration according to the extrinsic biomarker. The left panel shows you the results for intrinsic epigenetic age acceleration and the p-values are less, you know. And this makes sense to me because my pan tissue clock um, really measures properties of hematopoietic stem cells. The, um, so this clock is very good for picking up um, um, somatic mutations in hematopoietic stem cells and so on. But it's not great at um, uh, detecting immunosenescence or um, inflammation and so on. By contrast, the epigenetic age acceleration of the extrinsic clock does relate to blood cell composition by construction. So it does uh, track inflammation and so on. Um, now, um, the other analysis in this paper show that these results remain significant after you adjust for various confounders, but I feel the figure one summarizes the main findings. Now I come to another um, paper by Janice Long and uh, um, um, Paul Mann, um, who studied HIV. And um, I can tell you, um, HIV is one of the conditions that has a, a pretty strong effect on epigenetic clocks, certainly my pan tissue clock, and also in multiple organs so, and tissues. So in this study, um, the authors looked at um, blood, but I can tell you um, HIV also accelerates epigenetic aging in brain tissue and kidney and other human tissues. And um, yeah, so this study um, just looked at um, these patients and they found that yes, telomere length shortens a little bit um, with age. So, um, but um, in the very same people, you see a much stronger um, for methylation age, which is a well-known finding by now. Uh, methylation clocks have much stronger correlations with age than telomere length. But here is um, the main finding that epigenetic age acceleration increased with um, the days of infection. And um, there's quite some literature now on HIV, I should tell you. Um, Again, all these papers validate these findings. Um, and this is also in children, for example. Um, children um, who have HIV show epigenetic age acceleration. Conversely, heart treatment seems to um, reverse some of these epigenetic changes. Yeah. Moving to the next article. Um, this was a study by postdoc Michael Thompson who developed an epigenetic clock for dogs and wolves. I think this was one of the first clocks for uh, non-human species. Other clocks that appeared in the same year um, described clocks for uh, mice. And um, yeah, so this, this clock was based on um, so-called RRBS data, reduced representation bisulfide sequencing data. These data were generated by Matteo Pellegrini who is an expert on RBS. And um, well, here you go. I mean, this um, we do describe an epigenetic clock for dogs in this paper. Now I should tell you, um, I'm about to publish a paper that describes far more accurate clocks um, based on a particular array platform called the mammalian methylation array. So if you are interested in measuring aging in dogs, I um, I would um, um, not recommend this particular clock um, because we have far more accurate clocks. Um, now I want to move to um, a study of a, an important progeria, which is Werner syndrome, so-called adult progeria. 
And here we um, studied um, epigenetic age acceleration in blood samples. This was a study with Anna Meyerhofer and Thomas Half. And um, here I show you the punchline. Uh, individuals with Werner syndrome exhibit greatly accelerated epigenetic age according to multiple clocks. And um, so um, this study is very exciting. I think I believe it because I remember I've seen a similar phenomenon when we analyzed also, um, I think, a mouse model of Werner syndrome. So I believe it. But um, one thing that uh, um, um, I would have loved to see it validated in an, another human cohort. So here you can see we had 18 blood samples from Werner individuals and 18 controls. Sample size isn't too bad, p-value 0.01. You know? So I do trust it, but um, I would say it would be wonderful if somebody could um, try to validate it. And also, one should really look at post-mortem tissues. You know, this is a study of blood, but um, what about brain or, or liver or any other tissue? Do we see age acceleration? It remains to be seen. Um, now I come to another important um, article from Brian Chen and um, um, Abraham Aviv, who looked at the relationship between leukocyte telomere length and uh, blood cell composition and methylation age. And uh, this study stands out by its very large sample size and also by the fact that the telomere measurements were very carefully conducted by uh, Professor Aviv, who used um, southern blotting-based measurements of telomere length. And um, the main findings were that, yes, um, leukocyte telomere length and um, so-called extrinsic epigenetic age acceleration showed a strong uh, showed a significant relationship. I wouldn't call it strong, you know. So I want to uh, give you a sense of the effect sizes. So here, and pick the lower left panel. Um, here, Brian shows leukocyte telomere length on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have epigenetic age acceleration according to the Hannum clock, this in, um, an extrinsic clock. And you see a correlation minus 0.16, you know? I mean, you can, it's statistically very significant because of the large sample size, but it's a weak correlation, you know? And um, the results make perfect sense because EEAA keeps track of the abundance of naive T cells and immunosenescence and naive, uh, T cells, naive cytotoxic T cells, actually have longer telomeres. So the results is, makes perfect sense, you know. Um, so yes, higher level common, so EEAA relates, but but this is not true for um, my pan tissue clock or what is known as intrinsic epigenetic age acceleration. The so-called cell intrinsic epigenetic age acceleration is epigenetic aging after you remove the confounding effect of blood cell composition. After you condition uh, the, um, the analysis based on blood cell composition, there is no relationship between epigenetic clocks and telomere length. Um, now we come to another paper by Morgan Levine. And this um, is, uh, important paper because it describes the first second generation clocks a clock so this clock which is known as uh, methylation pheno age or phenotypic age um, um, was constructed to predict morbidity and mortality risk in humans it wasn't constructed as an estimator of chronologic age um, so based on that AIM, morbidity risk estimator, we call it a second generation epigenetic clock. And um, the analysis um, was done in three phases. So first, Morgan um, found plasma biomarkers that uh, predict all-cause mortality. So forget methylation, it was just proteins um, that um, and um, plasma biomarkers of organ dysfunction. 
and, and to, that predict lifespan. And that plasma-based uh, biomarker we call phenotypic age. Now in the second step, Morgan regressed phenotypic age on cytosines and now developed a methylation-based estimator. So it's called DNA methylation pheno age. Why? Because it, it's based on cytosines. And then um, we related methylation pheno age to many conditions, all listed here to understand the biology and um, yeah, so pheno age is a wonderful predictor of mortality risk um, compared to first generation clocks. And it, um, it predicts um, um, also many other age related phenotypes. Look at the um, predicted values for cancer, tend, uh, very, sig uh, very significant p values. Again, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's clinically. Uh, relevant. Um, however, for, in, in the sense of an epidemiological study, there's no question that phenotypic age predicts cancer, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and so on. And, um, and then pheno age also relates uh, quite strongly to smoking, as expected, because smoking increases your mortality risk. Um, it relates, it, it can be applied to other tissues. Um, Morgan and I occasionally applied even to fibroblasts. Um, having said this, we have better clocks for fibroblasts. Um, I actually prefer the so-called skin and blood clock for fibroblasts. And um, yeah, moving on. Um, now here we talk about in vitro studies. Um, um, this is a different clock, uh, the so-called skin on blood clock, but I could have named it differently. I actually struggled with the name of that clock for a while because the original motivation of this clock was to have a clock for fibroblasts. And the reason was that my pan tissue clock is not very accurate in fibroblasts. I always thought it's a limitation. So I wanted to have a custom clock for in vitro studies. And um, the, the clock that described in this article um, does it. I mean, we use that clock for all in vitro studies. Um, now, <clears throat> um, the clock was really applied then to fibroblast samples from Hutchins and Skilford progeria. Again, I was always very interested in progeria models. And this Hutchins and Skilford progeria is, um, um, sorry, the Hutchins and Skilford progeria is so-called, um, 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 well, early progeria. It aff afflicts children. So it's really heartbreaking. You see um, children here um, that are five years old and they already have the manifestations of old age. And uh, it's due to um, mutations in um, the uh, lamina um, associated uh, gene. And um, we um, secured uh, fibroblast samples from the Progeria Research Foundation in New York. We analyzed all of them. And um, this panel shows you kind of the punchline that um, when we apply this new clock for fibroblasts to these fibroblast uh, samples from progeria patients, we do see epigenetic age acceleration, but the effects are weak, weak effects, you know, so p-value 0.02, I would say, you know, um, and, and let me mention, when I applied my original pan tissue clock to these samples, I didn't see any effect. If anything, I saw the opposite effect. And um, so I would say, yes, there is epigenetic age acceleration in fibroblasts, um, but the effect is weak. And um, now you could ask, well, what about if I analyze blood samples from Hutchins and Skilford progeria individuals? And uh, fortunately, I know the answer um, because recently we published a paper that showed that there is no effect, you know. So interestingly, blood does not show epigenetic age acceleration in, in this um, um, progeria type. And I also looked at um, 
uh, mouse models of Hutchins and Skillful progeria. And there again, the effects are weak, you know. So overall, Hutchins and Skillful progeria, despite its strong phenotypic manifestations of uh, aging, um, really has only a weak effect on, on epigenetic clocks, uh, at least the clocks that I studied. You know. um, contrast that to um, contrast Hutchins and Skillful progeria to Down syndrome. Uh, Down syndrome, huge effects. You know. um, now, moving to another paper. Um, this is a paper from um, Ken Raj, who um, is really an expert on in vitro studies. And he um, showed in this paper um, definitively that epigenetic aging is distinct from senescence, cellular senescence. And in particular, it's not prevented by telomerase expression. As you know, um, telomerase expression immortalizes cells. It prevents replicative senescence, but it does not stop epigenetic clocks. And um, this paper um, it, it, it does many things. It's a very careful study from Ken Raj. And uh, for one thing, he used um, many um, um, donors. And here he first evaluates neonatal fibroblasts. And um, let me explain the, um, maybe we go to the right panel, which shows the um, um, skin and blood clock that I just described. Um, why? Because it's perfect for fibroblasts. The x-axis shows cumulative population doubling levels. And what you see is that methylation age increases as you passage the cells. And, but interestingly, the lower panel shows when you immortalize cells, you know, the h tert immortalized cells, they continue to uh, exhibit increases in methylation age. To explain that, by CPD around 45 or so, these cells senesce if they haven't been immortalized, right? So, um, however, the orange dots are the immortalized cells and you, you see continuous increase. So it's a very nice study, um, um, but the paper does a lot more because in this study, we looked at mutants of H. tert. So there are different ways of um, uh, mutating um, the telomerase. And um, so for example, you can mutate um, um, telomerase synthesis or extension of lifespan and so on. So various uh, mutants. And they, the punchline was that the one, um, any mutation that led to an extension of proliferative lifespan, so any uh, mutations of TERD that still maintained um, this property that the cells could proliferate and um, avoid replicative senescence, any of those mutations did not affect the epigenetic uh, uh, clock. It didn't stop it, you know. So, yeah, so in, in, in a, and it, it showed that the telomerase per se has no effect on the epigenetic clock. It's all about the property that telomerase can extend the replicative lifespan, and that leads then to an increase of methylation age. Moving to another um, study. So um, here, Mike Thompson um, described a um, epigenetic clock for um, mice. It's based on, again, um, RRBS data generated from Matteo Pellegrini's lab. Um, and this was the third publication um, that before we published our RRBS mouse clock. Uh, there were several other groups that published RRBS based mouse clocks, Vadim Gladyshev's uh, team and also Wolf Reich's team uh, and um, um, probably, and, and um, UCSD team, um, Eidecker et al. So there were several groups that published RRBS-based clocks. Um, this is yet another incarnation. By being late, we had the largest training set. 
And um, however, I should tell um, this clock and all of these RBS based clocks are being used in various publications. But I should tell you, I have um, far more accurate mouse clocks um, based on um, an, uh, an array. So array based clocks are more accurate. Um, moving on, um, here I show you um, a study by Andrew Teschendorf. And to explain, um, the title says cell and tissue type independent age associated methylation changes are not rare but common. And um, to explain the motivation of the study, um, there was a paper where the author said that um, um, age effects are not preserved across tissues. So in other words, if a cytosine, let's say, gains methylation in liver, that cytosine may not gain methylation in blood. And this paper was correct. Um, Actually, um, overall, most aging effects are tissue specific, cell type specific. So that's true. However, the paper um, may have led to confusion because people will then think, oh, okay, um, aging effects are tissue specific, cell type specific. And um, Andrew Teschendorf um, really beautifully showed that um, there are highly conserved cytosines, conserved across tissue types, you know, where, and so in other words, of course you can find um, thousands of cytosines whose gain of methylation um, in blood uh, replicates in 10 other tissues in, in humans. Um, these cytosines, um, the biology is also well understood. These cytosines are often located near um, um, sites targeted by polychrome repressive complex two and um, in more generally bivalent chr chromatin regions. And um, so this was a very careful study by Andrew Teschendorf and um, I think um, where he looked at um, high con and, and demonstrated high conservation in different blood cell types, but also fibroblasts and so on. Um, now we come to another paper by um, scientist Akelou, um, who developed um, our best mortality risk predictor, which we named after the Grim Reaper for a reason. So this um, is called DNA methylation Grim H, um, and it strongly predicts lifespan and health span. Um, this makes a strong claim, but I can assure you this has been replicated in, in 20 other papers. Um, often I give a talk to people and I say, if you don't replicate this uh, finding for Grimage, I, I will pay for, for your data because um, it just replicates it. It, it does predict um, lifespan. And um, so here, um, Ake, um, defined the second generation clock as a predictor of time to death using a Cox model, where she used age and gender actually as explicit covariates. So do you see, this is not an age clock um, or an age estimator, it estimates mortality risk. Age and gender are covariates. But um, another attractive feature of this biomarker is that it's very interpretable the cytosines that underlie it uh, can be interpreted as estimating various uh, plasma proteins. For example, growth differentiation factor 15, which is one of the top um, genes that come uh, that are related to, to cellular senescence, interestingly, the so-called SASP genes, or PI1, this is plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, also uh, a well-known biomarker. But do you see, you read Pi one, and you think protein, but to emphasize it, this is strictly a biomarker based on cytosine methylation. So it estimates Pi one levels in the blood, and um, yeah. And so in this study, um, Ake showed um, very impressive um, p values for mortality uh, risk, ten to the minus seventy five in all these different cohorts. And um, 
there was an interesting finding in the lower panel here you see on uh, lower right you see that we have a methylation based estimator of smoking pack years smoking history and what you can observe is um, that the p-value is 10 to the minus 47 but the interesting thing is that the methylation based estimator of smoking pack years outperforms self-reported smoking history when it comes to mortality risk and this finding has also been validated in several independent studies so curiously um, methylation may simply measure vulnerability perhaps to smoking or conversely maybe people um, have recall bias they don't fill out the forms correctly so this study does many other things for example it relates grim age to um, fatty liver disease it relates it to diet um, it relates it to omega-3 supplements and uh, it always shows the expected relationships moving on this is a study by shigemi matsuyama who looked at um, human fibroblasts in vitro and he showed for the first time that hypoxia slowed epigenetic clocks. And um, further, he showed um, that HTERT expression does not uh, stop epigenetic aging, similar to the paper from Kain Raj. So he validated it. But what is novel here, um, Shigemi also evaluated SV40 large T. Um, immortalization and um, the thing is the we didn't quite find anything uh, for sv40 large t um, i um, the results were a bit ambiguous so i feel um, the, this study should be repeated with larger sample sizes but um, in any event shigemi showed very nicely that um, hypoxia slows the epigenetic clocks so um, so for here, here you see these p-values so um, um, the slowed effects according to two different clocks skin and blood uh, blood clock and the original pan tissue clock now we come to another paper um, from ken raj who carefully evaluated rapamycin which um, obviously is of great interest to the aging community. And he found that rapamycin slowed epigenetic aging of keratinocytes. And um, that's a remarkable finding because when we looked in, at uh, the effect of rapamycin on blood, um, we never saw a beneficial effect, you know. Um, however, this effect I trust because um, Ken um, looked at several different donors. It's very reproducible. And so I've encouraged uh, the community and everyone who listens to carefully evaluate whether rapamycin maybe slows epigenetic aging in human skin, right? Because keratinocytes are in the skin. Um, but yeah, um, in, in other studies, I looked at the effect of rapamycin on the blood of um, marmosets, which is a monkey. And um, also in a sm much smaller human study, I, I didn't observe an effect on human blood. Um, moving on to another clock, um, which is based on placenta. So um, it turns out the placenta is really different from other cell types, uh, drastically different when it comes to aging effects, which means <clears throat> when you have any of the clocks I mentioned, the pan tissue clock, the skin and blood clock, but any of these clocks, they will simply not apply to human placental tissue. And the biology is completely different. But here, Yun Sung Lee, uh, developed placental clocks that are tailor-made for measuring gestational age of the baby based on methylation in the placenta and and, and the 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 accuracy is remarkable so um, we have here a clock on the left panel this is our novel clock i should tell you there was a previous publication a couple of years earlier 
by Maynard et al. that also had a placental clock. And here we just compare our placental clock to the clock by Maynard. Long, uh, when it comes to um, estimating gestational age of the baby. And um, both clocks work, but I think you can see this clock is a remarkably accurate cor correlation 0.82 or so. So um, or, um, in this case, 0.99, very accurate. Um, moving on, this is a different study by Eric Kim and Laura Kupjanski from Harvard, who looked at whether optimism is associated with methylation age. And um, this was a negative finding. Basically, it's not associated. Um, and I think it's important to sometimes uh, publish negative findings. You know, um, So yeah, because uh, many people are interested in the topic does, for example, meditation or does depression um, uh, relate to epigenetic aging? There are a couple of studies um, that um, looked at it. Overall, um, my impression is that these effects of mood and um, are, are very weak, probably um, reflecting that epigenetic aging processes um, are partially genetic. Okay, so um, heritability, maybe 40% or 20%, depending on who you talk to. Um, they relate um, often to inflammation. So yeah, I would say the, these first generation clocks at least uh, don't seem to relate. <clears throat> this is now um, another paper that presents a novel biomarker of, um, that uh, uh, is meant to emulate telomere length. So remember how I told you earlier that overall our epigenetic clocks have at best a weak correlation with telomere length. Uh, maybe um, the best is EEAA, which is uh, by construction tra tracking blood cell composition, and there the correlation was 0.16. So then we turned it around and said, well, why don't we build a methylation-based estimate of telomere length? And uh, this was accomplished here. And um, what we, so we call it DNA methylation telomere length. And um, please look at the right panel, panel B, upper right. The X axis shows you our methylation estimate of telomere length. And the Y axis shows you southern blotting based measures of telomere length. And the correlation is 0.44. And and you can look at it in two ways. Uh, is the glass half full or half empty? Um, to me, a correlation of 0.44 is pretty strong. So yes, it does track telomere length, but it's not the same as telomere length, right? Uh, for, for that, so it cannot replace telomere length. It's a slightly different biology, you know? Um, and, and this, by the way, holds up. I would say our biomarker DNA MTL, the telomere estimator, has a correlation 0.4 roughly with um, that. But I, let's just compare. Uh, um, on the left side, you, um, these, uh, on the left side, you see um, actual leukocyte-based telomere length. On the y, uh, on the right-hand side, you see our methylation biomarker, and on the x-axis, you see chronologic age. Clearly, much stronger age correlation for the methylation-based estimator, you know. Coming to my statement, leukocyte telomere length has actually only a moderate relationship with age. Do you see here in the Framingham Heart Study correlation minus 0.31 for telomere length, whereas the methylation bi biomarker has a correlation minus 0.62, much stronger. But um, there's more to it when you ask, well, what about um, smoking? So, um, when you look at the effect of smoking on actual uh, southern blotting based telomere length, smoking is barely significant, point, p value 0 0.05. Okay. And these are large sample sizes, you know. So smoking, in essence, barely touches telomere length. However, when you look at our methylation based measure of telomere length, there's a strong relationship. 
p value 10 to the minus six you know and um so yes if, if you care about tracking the effect of um, poor lifestyle choices such as smoking um, methylation biomarker would be far better and then um here i show you mortality risk estimates left hand side shows you um, the p-value for actual telomere length 0.004 barely significant um, if you use our methylation based estimator p-value 10 to the minus nine much stronger you know so and and anyway we did a lot of these studies uh, menopause um, our methylation based estimator relates to um, um, early menopause you know women who experience early menopause have slightly shorter telomeres according to the methylation marker but not according to actual telomere length similar um, so in, on, on all categories i would say the methylation marker outperforms um, actual telomere length but there's an important caveat um, it's different biology um, telomere length is a very important hallmark of aging and so um, so it should be measured you know um, yeah moving on um, this is a study where we now looked at individual cytosines that relate to leukocyte telomere length this is a study by Yun Song Li and here we found genes and cytosines that have a strong relationship to leukocyte telomere length in different racial groups and um, I mean people who study telomere biology they should take a very good look at this uh, list of genes I think it could be quite interesting to um, understand the biology of telomere length um, maintenance Um, now I move to a different study um, by Elena Colicino, Andrea Baccarelli, and a large group of um, collaborators that is, in essence, an EWAS of mortality risk. Remember how we built grim age, pheno age, and so on as predictors of mortality risk? This paper has a different aim. It wants to look at individual cytosines, at genes and neighboring genes that relate to mortality risk. And um, so here um, we found uh, several such cytosines. And interestingly, in essence, all of them relate to smoking, you know. <laughs> so if you want to understand the biology of mortality risk in humans, uh, cytosines, it's mainly smoking effects one way or another. Um, However, um, don't walk away thinking that it's only smoking history because uh, from other studies, for example, grim age, um, we know that grim age is a beautiful predictor of mortality risk in never smokers, people who never smoke, but you, you can still predict mortality risk. So yeah, um, so I, um, moving on, this is a um, study by Chi Yan who uh, looked at the question of uh, stochastic epigenetic mutations. Um, so um, there was an Italian team, again, Claudio Franceschi, and um, who had introduced the concept of epigenetic, uh, stochastic epigenetic mutation. In essence, you have a cytosine and it uh, there's a mutation and suddenly the cytosine um, leads uh, to a drastically different methylation level, three uh, uh, quartiles away from the median. So they call that an epigenetic mutation. And um, for each person, you can calculate the total number of such point mutations to the cytosines, and you can relate it to um, epigenetic clocks. And here I show you how um, these um, epigenetic, we call it epigenetic mutation load. Some people have a lot of epigenetic mutations uh, at cytosines. And what we observe is that this epigenetic mutation load has a weak but significant correlation with our epigenetic clocks. 
For example, do you see here lower panel, you see correlation 0.24 for grim age or 0.18. So yes, some of these epigenetic mutations do correlate with our epigenetic clocks. Correlations are weak. Um, they're not 0.9, you know. And so I would say um, these stochastic mutations don't explain uh, um, everything that is known about epigenetic clocks. They, there's more than entropy to epigenetic clocks. There are additional um, mechanisms that should be mentioned when, when we try to understand epigenetic clocks. And um, the final paper in the collection was uh, published by Emily Pierce and Shahina Skadala, who again looked at um, our methylation-based estimate of telomere length and compared it now to flow fish and qPCR-based measurements of telomere length. And um, they showed what I uh, reported earlier. Remember how I told you telo methylation telomere length correlates with actual telomere length correlation around 0.4. So here they found 0.4 and in another study 0.56, you know. So overall, this again highlights the point that our methylation-based estimate of telomere length is not the same as actual telomere length. If you uh, want uh, actual telomere length, you have to use um, another method beyond methylation. Yeah. Yeah, so um, with that, I conclude the discussion of this um, special edition. Um, for those who, who stayed and listened to it all, you are really awesome. You have uh, infinite patience. The only thing that's tougher to listen to all of that is to actually write the papers. It's, uh, that's really tough. <laughs> so thank you for your interest. Yeah. A, amazing that uh, this is only your publications in aging, <laughs> one journal. And so, and I know there's been many um, and that you were able to off the top of your head actually comment on every details on every single one of those. So uh, kudos to you. Um, yeah, and kudos to aging. I'm grateful that they um, published so many of my papers. Yeah.